Um, so, for, for some people, I guess, uh, AP tests are coming up, and I'm bored. It's like 9 o'clock right now, I'm kind of bored, so I thought I would revisit the free response section of the AP Physics E Mechanics test I took two years ago, and see how easy it is for me now. Um, yeah, that's all. Hopefully, maybe this will be helpful to people taking AP Physics E Mechanics. I'm not sure. Hopefully. Um, I'm not going to need any of these equations or whatnot, probably. Um, let's just do it. In an experiment, students use video analysis. I remember this. Use video analysis to try to blah, 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 blah. What is, what is this a graph of? Velocity over time. Okay. So they dropped some some object in fluid and tracked its velocity. Does the speed of the object increase, decrease, or remain the same? Well, it's going to increase, right? I mean, you can just see that in the graph. It, it goes up, so it increases. In a brief statement, describe the direction of the object's acceleration and how magnitude of the acceleration changes as it fell. So the acceleration is downwards because its velocity is increasing downwards. Right, and so since its velocity is increasing downwards, the acceleration is, in the, is down. And the magnitude is decreasing, because if you look, um, I guess I can right, accelerate. I want to right, acceleration is a change in velocity over change in time. So you can see that the derivative of this graph is decreasing as time goes on. So the acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration is actually getting smaller as time goes on. Um, using the graph calculator, an approximate value for the magnitude of the acceleration at point two. You can just draw draw a line tangent to that and then take the slope of that line. Because like I said, right, velocity, acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So you can just draw a tangent line and make a guess. And, that, and that's what that wants you to do. Um, the students use, use this equation that represents velocity to model the speed of the falling object and find the best fit coefficients to be these numbers. Use the above equation to derive an expression for the magnitude of the vertical displacement. Um, YT, I just want to check something. What's the, do we know the height of this? Since it's displacement, I'm just going to, I'm going to assume that the top of this lid is zero, and then we're going down. Um, so it gives us velocity. You might be wondering, how, how, is, how is having velocity any help? Velocity actually equals the integral, um, I, I didn't need that, I don't know, I'm sorry, my brain doesn't work. Velocity is the integral from, in this in this case, from zero to time t of, or this is position, or I, sorry, this is y. It's change in y position equals the integral from zero to t of um, v dot or v times dt. Um, that's just true because, um, so, VDT, right, we know, we know displacement equals, generally, right, if you want to know how far something went, you take its velocity multiplied by the amount of time. So what this is doing is it's taking a infinitesimally small, tiny little point, and then, looking at its velocity, because its velocity will be constant over a very, very, very small interval. See how far it went in a very small time dt, and then integrate all of that. So that's what this is going to be. And so avail evaluating this integral, it's a minus a e to bt t. That's a t and the integral of this is going to be I think
And then a good check is to derive this and see if you get the same answer. So there's this negative BT, oh, wait. I think that should be there. Um, bring, when you derive you, when you drive in exponent or like an E, you bring this down. So if you bring this down, it cancels with this and turns it negative, which is what we see. So this, this should be what the um, displacement is. And of course, you could probably simplify that or whatever. That should be, that should be fine. Um, derive an expression for the magnitude of the net force exerted on the object as a well. So we have velocity. Um, as we all know and love Newton's second law. Um, so I don't know if the mass is given to us. I think it is. It says like, a, it's like what? Yeah, 12 grams. So we know what the mass is. I'm not going to bother writing that out. But we know what the mass is, so we just need the acceleration. And as you can see right here, acceleration is dv dt. We're given what v is. So you just take the first derivative with respect to time of a minus. Right? And so that a is going to go away. Bring this b down so you get positive a b e to the and, that should, and then that multiplied by the mass should be the force. Not too bad. The students repeat the experiment with a taller glass cylinder that is filled with the same fluid. The cylinder is tall enough so that the object reaches a constant speed. Okay. I'm just thinking. So, this, you, this should be you just take the limit as, t, as time goes to infinity um, to see what the maximum speed is. Because its constant speed is going to be what it maxes out to. Sorry. Its constant speed is going to be what it maxes out to. So um, you should just be able to do this. Uh, I'm just going to write that because I'm too lazy actually. And if you look, um, you have a minus a you have this essentially. Ignoring the integral, you have this expression. And so, as t goes to infinity, that's obviously going to stay the same. Um, this e to the negative bt, you can rewrite that as, as, the, as this. Right? And so, as t goes to infinity, this is going to go to infinity. So, this, this expression is going to evaluate to zero. So, the limit as t goes to infinity of v of t is just going to be what a is. And um, cool fact, if you actually look at the equation, or if you look at the coefficients they give, um, it's get, A is given in meters a second. So, okay. Uh, and then determine the force exerted by the fluid. So, when there's, when there's no... Um, when it's constant speed, there's no acceleration, and if there's no acceleration, the net force is zero, and so zero is going to equal the sum of the forces, which is force of the fluid minus mg, where m is the mass of the object, and so the force due to the fluid is just going to equal mg. Um, the sign here is a little weird. I chose... Up, upwards to be the positive direction. Uh, it doesn't matter, you get the answer. So, that's problem one. That was relatively easy. Um, so, so difficult to do with that. Um, okay, so two, we have, I remember those two. We have basically this funnel system. Um, let's just start with A. Determine the speed of block one at the bottom of its swing just before it makes contact with block two. So it looks like we're starting block one at a 90 degree sort of thing going on here. So um, its potential energy is going to equal its rotational kinetic energy. But um, I've done this enough times to know that um, the potential energy is just going to equal the translational kinetic energy. So you're going to get something like... The ma mass of block 1 times g times its height. And we know its height is L, right? 
and that is equal to one half um, is equal to this. And so ends cancel out, so you get v equals the square root to the L. So there's question A. Uh, question B. On the Doppler drawing label the forces that act on block only before they come up to you. Okay. So we know that block block one's moving in a circle, right? So we know that it has some sort of centripetal it has a net centripetal acceleration upwards towards the center. And so um, the, what matters here is the length. So we know the net force is up. And so this this one up has to be longer than the one here down. And this is a force due to gravity. Um, you know, it's, it's, on, it's on Earth, we're assuming, so it's being pulled down by Earth. And then this is actually the tension of the string. And this has to be longer than Fg because the net is upwards, right? Um, derive an expression for the tension FT in the string, the string is vertical. Okay, so like I just said, there's a net centripetal acceleration upwards, and centripetal acceleration equals V squared over R. So MA turns into MV squared over R, and that equals F of T minus F of G, which is the math, I should probably mass of the first block times g, and so we get m1 times v is right here, so I'm just going to, v squared is just going to square root. Um, r here is l, and so this is actually going to cancel. So let me just write l there. Right, because 2gl, so the, the l is going to go away, so we just have 2g there, actually, so I'm just going to write a 1. And then that's minus so I think the force of tension did I do something wrong? Hold on. I'm just confused because it's equal that that means it's equal to this. So oh, sorry, stupid, that's a plus. So I don't do math in your head. You you add this term over, and so you end up getting m1 is 3m, right? Yeah. 3m and then 2g plus g is just 3g. So then I'm not going to simplify, but that's obviously 9mg, right? I'm just not going to multiply that because I need room. Um, D. For parts D and G, the value for the length of the pendulum is 75 centimeters. Okay. Calculate the de the time between the instant block 2 leaves the table and the instant first contacts the floor. Okay, so I'll, we know we know what the height of block 2 is and its initial... Um, we know how far it falls... Um, and, okay, I'm just going to stop. We're, we use kinematic equations here, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we can just use kinematic equations. So we know it's in the y direction. Its initial velocity is zero. Its final velocity is, we don't care. Its acceleration is 9.8. And, um, its displacement is... 2 times L, so 1.5 meters, and its um, time is what we're solving for. Uh, this is just how I like to do kinematic equations, is I write out all the variables, then I look and see which one I need, and so I just know this is a pretty common like scenario. If you're going to use the one that's... Um, sorry. You're going to use this one, and so vi is 0, so that goes away, and uh, delta x is delta y, in this case, but equal to 1.5, and 
and then you get one half a t squared, and so a is 4.9, or one half a is 4.9 t squared, so t equals... I'm not actually going to bother typing this, or calculating this all out. E. Oh, okay. I was about to say, how do we do that? Um, it gives us how far it went horizontally, and we know what the time is. So its speed doesn't change in the x direction, it only changes in the y, right? So we know that it went... Um, So we know that it went um, 4L, or I think that's like 3 meters. It went 3 meters, and we know how, how long it took to go 3 meters. So from these two, um, velocity equals distance over time. So, I, I again, I'm not going to... 4 times L is 3, so it's... Distance should be this. Um, there's that. Can I do the speed of block one just after project block two? Okay, so this uses the con conservation of linear momentum. So the the momentum in the system before is um three m, that's the mass of object 1, times its, what its velocity is, which is up here, square root of 2gl. Then after the collision, we have this new velocity, so it's, um, what is the mass of block 2? m? Okay, so m times v, we're going to get this. And then we want, oh wait, sorry, this is not a 3. And then we want we want v1 final, and so what we're going to do is first we're going to get rid of this m because we don't know what it is, and then we're going to move this term over and then divide by three. And so when we divide by three, this is going to go away. Well, then this one, okay, whatever, I'm just going to write it out. We get three times the square root of two g l e minus square root of 4.9 equals 3 times the final velocity, so I'm just going to multiply this by one third. And that should be the initial velocity of block 1. Um, or I mean the final velocity, the final velocity of block 1. And so, yeah, hopefully I didn't make any mistakes, I kind of went fast. Um, maybe, I don't know if I can, what's the, calculate the angle AK. Um, I'm just going to make a new one. Um, and I'm, I'm not actually going to calculate any of these numbers out, because I don't feel like doing that. Um, so part, part G, um, okay, so this is a conservation of energy, the, the amount of kinetic energy it has at the beginning is going to equal the number, the amount of potential energy it has at the end. And we just calculated what the initial, well, in this case now, the initial velocity of block one is. I'm just going to write it like that. It has some number. So we know that one half times 3m, that, that thing we just calculated, um, I'll use the same, that has to equal the mass times uh, g times the height that it achieves. And um, we need this height to calculate what the angle is. I'll just make a drawing here. So we have, that's a little, a little crooked, but whatever. Right, we have like block one. Like, why did I draw one horizontally? Whatever. That's the block. This is our theta. Um, we want to calculate what this is. And so this this is h, okay, and we can we can solve this right. This goes away, that goes away. So h equals. 
something like that. It doesn't matter yeah, whatever. Um, once we have that, we know this. This is the length of it, so this is L minus H, and then this is L. And so we're going to use the cosine, right, to figure out what the angle is. So cosine is so katoa, so it's adjacent over hypotenuse. And that should be the theta maxes. Um, again, you calculate H from conservation of linear moment, or not, no, conservation of energy, and then you just, yeah. Um, that's wrong. Uh, question three. This is a rotation one. This is one that is typically considered the hardest. Let's see what I let's see what I can do. Um, I remember this very vividly. Um, well, not exactly the answers, but I remember like kind of what the setup was like. So I'm just gonna go on the first problem. Drive an expression for the angular speed omega p of the platform. Okay. Okay, so the wheel the wheel exerts a constant horizontal force of magnitude f. That's very important. Constant and horizontal. Um, and it's tangent to the wheel, which means it's exerting a torque on the wheel. And that torque is what is accelerating it and causing it to have whatever angular speed. And so that torque equals I of the platform times the angular acceleration. And so this torque is torque and very generally is the force times how far away it is from the axis of rotation. So that's just going to be F and then D is what they're calling, right, the distance from the vertical axis. And then, um, so it's being constantly accelerated, right? These are all constant values. So the acceleration is constant. And so its angular speed at any point is just going to be this acceleration times how much time has passed. And so it's saying, it's calling the time that passed delta t. So it's just f d delta t over the moment of, or the inertial, the moment of inertia of the um, platform. Um, b, kinetic energy. Um, important distinction to make, this is referring to rotational kinetic energy, and rotational kinetic energy is actually one, I mean, it's like really similar, it's like kind of the same story. It's one half, mo like, I omega squared, it's like substituting in the angular equivalence for the variables. And so if we square this, and then, I mean, I'm not even going to do it, right, you just plug in what you got for omega and just throw it in there. It's not that hard, I'm not going to even bother doing that. Um, huh, um, oh, right, um, Okay, so the the tangential velocity where they're contacting is the same, right? Because it says that the wheel stays in contact without slipping. So, like, we have the we have this like platform, right? And then we have this. At this point right here, the tangential velocity is the same. So, tangential velocity of the platform equals the tangential velocity of the wheel, and so tangential velocity equals rotational velocity times the radius, um, the, like, radius we're looking at, of the thing that's spinning, and so for V, for the platform, omega, it, it doesn't, okay, I was just checking, we don't have to, like, substitute, maybe we just call it omega P, so omega P times its radius, which is D, equals what we're solving for times its radius, which is r. So it turns out that omega of the wheel is just that. The disk has the same rotational inertia as the platform.
And so linear momentum is conserved. Um, right, that's just the thing that happens. And so linear momentum is conserved. Um, that means L equals L, or, um, or this is, shoot, um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a blank. Um, right, and so if, since the rotational, rotational inertia is the same, this just got doubled. And so this, this I know is double of that, so you just get this, basically. And so WP is the original speed, so this I should actually be P. And yeah, that should, that just, that should be the answer. Um, it now uses a rotating platform data. Unknown object in our vertical axis of passive. Okay. The platform is rotating at an angular, initial angular speed W I mean, or W, omega I mean, direct center of mass directly above the center of the platform. Okay. Okay. On the graph of the previous page, draw a best fit line. Okay. Uh, that is draw a line. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not actually going to do any of these calculations because I'm lazy as fuck. I don't feel like so, um, so just draw a line, um, okay. Using a straight line, calculate the rotational inertia of the unknown object value of about a vertical axis of passing distance. Yes. Okay. That might sound really confusing, but in this situation, just gotta calm down and just, just, just go, and the answer will come to you. Um, what I mean is, so, how would we do this normally? We'd use conservation of angular momentum, right? So L equals L. Or this this disk is just spinning on its own, right? And so I forgot, do they call it W what do they call it? WP, right? Or maybe P. No, it's just omega initial. Sorry. This D should be an O. Yeah, this one might like the initial. Times the this, but then we're we had this new line right? Um Okay. This is just algebra. That should be true, and so you might, the only, I think it gives us what, yeah, it gives us the value for IP, so the only thing we don't know is what is WI over WF, right, well, what's that? So if you notice, you calculated the slope, right, or I'm sorry, you drew a best fit line, you can get the slope from that line, but be careful, this is WI over, or omega I over omega F, the slope equals this. Could you cooperate? The slope is that, right? So you have to take the invert or the reciprocal of the slope, right? So one over whatever value you got equals good. Substitute that in, and then you should get a number for how you. Kinetic energy of the spinning platform before the object is dropped on it is Ki. The total kinetic energy of the platform is Which What do the following is the is true? Well, it should lose kinetic energy, so the first one should be true. And the reason is, is, um... I think, like, technically, it's that it's an inelastic collision, which means it's not conserved, because they stick together, right? But the real reason is that it loses... It loses, the system loses energy to friction, and mostly friction, and sound, right? You drop it, it's going to make a clank, and that's going to lose energy. And then the friction of it sliding to get it rotating at the same speed, right? That's going to dissipate energy as heat. So the, fir the um, first one should, is true. The, it's going to lose kind of energy. 
One of the students observes that the center of mass of the object is not actually aligned to the edges of the platform. Is the experimental value of IU obtained in part 1 greater than, less than, or equal? It should be. It should be greater than. Um, so I'm just going to draw a circle to kind of like... Turn, um, this... Uh, hello. Let's pretend this is an upwards view of the disk, and then this is the object. This is like the rotation here with this this thing that we're testing out, right? Like, what's its rotation motion? If it's right on the middle, like, if it's right on the middle, then you can represent it as, like, a point on that. But as soon as the center of mass goes off, let's just say that... Okay, obviously this isn't, this isn't the center. Let's just pretend this is the center, right? And you have H? Well, there's something called the parallel axis theorem. So the rotation, the actual rotational... We would think that IU is the actual value plus this. And so we would we would get a greater value because of the parallel axis theorem, right? This extra MH squared that it's off by is going to be added on to what it actually is. And so it should be greater than that. Um, I don't know why I decided to record this. Um, I was really bored. How long was this? 31 minutes? Okay. How long do you get for for the free response questions? Um, Forty five minutes. Okay, I think we're good. I think I think we made it. I, th I think I did it. Uh, feel free to correct me if I made a mistake. I, I probably did. I'm pretty dumb. Um, I don't think this is going to be very helpful to anyone, but it was fun. Gave me a little bit of PTSD from when I did this two years ago and I was a lot stupider. Um, I mean, I ended up getting a five, so it all worked out in the end. I remember, though, um, for... Let me go back. For... Oh, oh where is it? For this... I scribbled the correct answer for um, A, B, and C. I just screwed it all up. I was really dumb. I screwed it all up. I figured out what the correct way to do. I didn't realize that um, the the velocity here was the same, and I didn't re I didn't think that like I didn't realize that was true, and so I kind of scrambled it right in the end. And I think if I didn't do that, I probably would have gotten a four, but I got a five. So. I mean, there, there's literally no difference now that I look back on it. If I got a four, I'd be in the same exact place I am now. But anyway, yeah, enjoy this whole video, I guess. Oh, you already did.